Okay, um, let's see. I'm going to get uh, get started here. Just a brief introduction. My name is Jason Biggs. I am a uh, developer for uh, for the Wolfram Language uh, Chemistry offerings, and I'm here to uh, to talk about uh, uh, the latest uh, offerings for uh, uh, Wolfram Language Chemistry coming out in version 12.2. Um, yeah, and now is when I uh, hit the stop video and uh, we just look at the the screen. Um, let's see. So the the title of the talk this year is Molecule Fingerprints and Visualization. Um, this is because uh, I felt that I should not use the same talk that I uh, use every single year, uh, New Developments in Wolfram Language Chemistry. So I've ad added that here as a uh, talk subtitle. And also, um, my manager told me, either always include the abstract on the front first page or don't include the abstract on the first page. I couldn't remember. So I've included an iconized version of the abstract here on the first page. Um, because I like to be funny. Uh, let's see. So this is the outline slide. Um, first, I will do a brief, a very brief history of chemistry in the, in the Wolfram language that involves going from uh, chemical data uh, to entity value to uh, molecule. Um, there will be a brief uh, look to the future. Um, we have a new data structure available in version 12.2, and we will uh, look briefly at the bio sequence. Um, then we'll talk about uh, molecule fingerprints, which uh, I've spent a good amount of time uh, working on, but is not fully ready for release in version 12.2. So this is this is going to be mainly a sneak peek of features to come. Then we will take a brief tour of some of the resource functions available that for a visualization of, of molecules. And then we'll finish by looking at the interactive molecule editor that is available in version 12.2 uh, titled Molecule Draw. So let's first look here at uh, the brief history of chemistry in the Wolfram language. So essentially in version six, we got uh, chemical data. We got chemical data, we got element data, isotope data. There were all of these, uh, these new functions to give access to curated data to, and by curated data, I mean, this is experimental data that's available from sources like NIST or PubChem, ChemSpider, or um, uh, publications put out by the, by the ACS. So you can, there are certain entities in it you can ask, for example, for the combustion heat, for Henry Law constants, for Van der Waals constants. These are all uh, <coughs> experimental values that are not computable directly. So they need to be, that's what, uh, that's what we mean by curated. And so that was in version six. Then in version 10, we introduced entities. And this provides more unified interface to the, to the knowledge base. So, so we, as I mentioned, we had chemical data, element data, isotope data. Well, the number of different types of, uh, of entities, the number of uh, XXX data functions would, would increase exponentially, but in, instead we, we introduced entity value. So rather than just simply the string uh, uh, representing the chemical, we now have these, we call them the yellow boxes, right? So this is underneath, when you, when you look at this, this is entity, chemical di diphenylmethane. And so it is a, uh, an object that represents this, uh, this entity in our database. And you can access many, many of the same, uh, let's see, so all of the same properties you could in chemical data plus many more. And it, there's a nice, uh, a much nicer uh, interface for accessing data on multiple, prop multiple entities, multiple properties, and different ways of uh, presenting the data. Then came uh, version 12, where we introduced the molecule. So the difference between a molecule and a chemical entity is that for a molecule, you're not relying on any database call. You're not relying on there already being an entity in the knowledge base. So this uh, entity doesn't need to be in chemical data, it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to be in PubChem. You could have made it up, you could have been the first one 
to ever think of this molecule and you write out its uh, IUPAC name and molecule will create a data structure from that. And then you can visualize, generate 2D or 3D coordinates and compute properties for it. This was introduced in version 12. And if you like, if you're curious, very curious among the, uh, the audience, you can see the entire design process because uh, that is something that, uh, that we've started doing. So it's, uh, so actually, if you look at for the, the very second episode of live CEOing, you'll find it was about uh, chemistry and we were deciding, do we, want, do we want to do this as an entity or as a, as a function? And we, did, we decided we wanted to do it as a function. And so that's how Molecule came about. And if you're ever curious about some of the decisions that were made, I recommend uh, <laughs> going to the tape. So, um, but now in version 12.2, we introduce the, uh, the bio sequence. And uh, this is not my area of expertise. This is developed uh, in-house by, by John Castle, our, our resident expert on uh, bioinformatics. So I highly recommend this presentation from uh, the last year's tech conference representing biological sequence data in the Wolfram language. So using a, a bio sequence, you can, you can create an object that represents a particular DNA sequence, for example. Um, you can convert that sequence into a peptide sequence by translating it or into to an RNA sequence by transcribing it. You can then take that peptide that you create and convert it into a molecule, if you like. It turns out to be rather large and you can actually generate 3D coordinates and view it. This becomes, uh, of course, this is a relatively small uh, protein with only 197 atoms. So the act of uh, generating 3D coordinates and, and plotting them becomes uh, more difficult the more atoms that you have, obviously. Let's see. So, so that is BioSequence. I highly recommend it. It's uh, available in 12.2 with a, a host of support functions. So now I'd like to talk briefly about a, a slightly esoteric topic that, uh, that I've become interested in over the past year. And so, so we have this new uh, functionality that's not quite ready for the sy system context. And so it's probably, hopefully will come out in the next version, but this is a sneak peek of the things that are to come. So the basic idea behind a, a molecule fingerprint is to take a molecule and convert it to a sequence of ones and zeros otherwise known as a bit vector, depending on the presence of certain chemical features. Also, alternatively, you can make a count vector, keeping track of how many times those features are present in the molecule. So that's step one, to convert, to create a molecule into a, a uh, fingerprint. Step two would then be to, to use various different distance measures to give a, an idea of the molecule similarity how, uh, how similar are two molecules. So the basic idea is that uh, molecules that share chemical features are more similar than molecules that don't. And so the, uh, um, the more alike two fingerprints are, the, the, the more similar the molecules are going to be. Well, of course, different types of chemical features lead to different types of similarity. And as a result in the literature and in common use nowadays, there are many different types of fingerprints available. Um, so the basic uh, functionality, the, the, uh, the basic idea here is that you would have a, a fingerprint function, which would uh, return an operator that could be, then be applied onto a molecule to generate a fingerprint. The, why does it need to be so convoluted? because there are many different options available. So if we look at the input form of that, we see, um, so it's an RD kit fingerprint. It returns a bit vector. Um, it, it's got various options, the, the minimum path length, the max path lengths, whether to include hydrogens, whether to include bat branched paths, how large do you, actually, do you want the resulting bit vector to be? 
whether to use bit bond types when generating the, uh, the bits. And these are all um, uh, vary from different type of fingerprint to, so the, so the different options, um, <clears throat> there, there are many different options for every type of fingerprint. And so wrapping it all up into one uh, uh, interface here is, is quite handy. But it means that you first have to generate a fingerprint function and then apply it onto a molecule to get your fingerprint. So another function will be molecule fingerprint similarity. So that would take two molecules as an input and return a numerical val value to represent how similar the molecules are. Zero being completely no overlap whatsoever and one being saying they're basically the same molecule. Um, molecule fingerprint similarity would take options such as a fingerprint function and a distance me measure. So another function will be molecule nearest where you take a list of molecules and a query molecule and then you return either the the molecule that is most like the query or um, the n molecules that are most like the query. So it's, it works very similar to nearest except it uses a the fingerprint similarity as the, uh, the, the main distance function. So, so a basic, the most basic type of, fin of fingerprints would be substructure fingerprints. So these are where you generate a set of substructure keys and then uh, this predefined set of keys, you enumerate it and then you, uh, you, you set um, bits or counts in the fingerprint based on on whether that feature is present. So the most, the most, the most simple feature set you can imagine is elements. So we know that uh, water contains oxygen. So I can say molecule contains to Q molecule of water, oxygen, true, but it doesn't have sulfur. So with that in mind, we can define a set of common elements and uh, in general, you could do, this is quite, this would be quite easy to do with all of the elements. So you could do element data, open close and generate all of them. But we don't need to do that because we're, this is just a simple example so that we can actually look at the fingerprints. So we set these common elements, we define a molecule. Let's see, let's make sure these are evaluated. And then and then we could generate this fingerprint ourselves, this Boolean vector by just asking, does the molecule contain that element and then looping over them. And we get a, a, a vector of uh, true false back. We can look at another molecule and ask the same question and we can get two different uh, fingerprints. So these lists of true and false. That given the two Boolean vectors, we then compute their similarity. In, uh, for molecule fingerprints, people often use the, what's called the, the Tanimoto similarity which is equivalent to the uh, to one minus the jacquard, jacquard dissimilarity, which is a built-in Wolfram language function. So using this uh, simple fingerprint with these common elephants, elements, uh, we can say that these molecules are uh, zero point or 75% similar. So to make this, uh, um, so that was uh, if we were to just do that using existing functions, but we, the, um, the whole idea here is to create a simple uh, and efficient API for generating these functions. So we create a fingerprint function based on substructures and we give the substructure patterns being the, the common elements. We generate the fingerprint function, then we apply that onto a list of two molecules and it, it returns to uh, bit vector data structures. And if you uh, like, you can look at the, the documentation. This is a data structure. So those were, these were introduced in 12.1. These have various uh, operations. They're mutable. Um, and uh, yeah, they're fully documented. So let's see, there we go. Um, you can, you apply those uh, to fingerprints. You can then visualize them and let's see. Is this, well, so those don't, don't exactly scale here. Um, let's see, so, so this, the, the ones and zeros tells you whether those, uh, those features are present or not present. And so then if we, want, if we wanted to compute the similarity, 
from these fingerprints, we would take we would find first the uh, um, the total number of bits between the two uh, fingerprints, and then the the total number of bits in common. So this is uh, the the bits that are set in both fingerprint one and two, and this is the total number of bits. And when we compute that, we get the same value for the similarity as we did uh, using the, the built-in jacquard dissimilarity. Or, we can, for efficiency's sake, we can feed both molecules to molecule fingerprint similarity and give the given uh, uh, fingerprint function. So we already defined this, and this is the, the substructure fingerprint that uses that list of common elements, and it returns the value of 0.75. So one more step would be to ask not just whether a given feature is present in a molecule, but how, um, how often does it occur in the molecule? So we can take those common elements and we can apply that to a molecule and count them. And so it, this, for this toy example, it essentially reproduces the chemical formula. We, uh, we see there are three hydrogen atoms, six carbon atoms, two oxygen atoms, et cetera. Um, or we can create a fingerprint function and tell it we, instead of a bit vector, we want a count vector. And we apply that to the two molecules and we receive uh, this back. So this is another form of a fingerprint. This is what, uh, so this is a count vector. And so with a count vector, we can't use the built-in jacquard dissimilarity. We instead use the, uh, the resource function, multi-set jacquard dissimilarity, which takes into account not just whether a, a certain feature is present, but how often it is present. So when you, when you compute the number of bits in common for the previous uh, computation, it takes into account how many of those bits are there in each of the molecules. And so we can use uh, the multi-set Jacquard dissimilarity and we can get a value and we see they're, they're less, these two molecules are less similar now that we take counts into effect, account. And as before, we can just, we can cut all of that out and call molecule fingerprint similarity directly and give it the, the fingerprint function, which is now defined to use count vectors instead of bit vectors. So uh, we can take that a little bit farther by uh, um, using a more sophisticated set of patterns. So in this case, we've, we've got a, a list of 300 predefined uh, uh, functional groups. And these functional groups have a name and they have a given pattern. Uh, so this, um, this, is, this is what's called a, a molecule pattern and it describes um, a carbon with four bonds to it and three of those are hydrogens. And it is ba bonded to another carbon atom about which we specify much, uh, much less. So that's, that's the definition uh, in a pattern of a primary carbon atom, same with secondary, tertiary carbon, um, and on the way down. So if we look at a given molecule and ask which of those patterns are present, we see it might have, um, uh, it's got a primary alcohol, rotatable bonds, uh, certain, uh, certain keys for, tautomer, for what being tautomerizable, um, so let's see, so if we define that, so then you can, uh, if you like, you can look to see whether the, where these, uh, um, ha these substructures occur in the molecule. I think it's fairly neat there. So now, now that we have that list of substructures defined, we can define a fingerprint function based off of those. And we can get back a count vector from it, and it, it will tell us exactly how many times we see those, those features in the molecule. And so that is, uh, would then be fed to the same similarity function as before. Another, so what we've seen so far are sub substructure key fingerprints, where you have a predefined set of substructures. But more commonly used nowadays are um, hash-based fingerprints, where the number of subst possible substructures is incredibly large. And so therefore, there is no attempt made to enumerate all of the substructures beforehand. Instead, you generate the substructures at the time of looking at a molecule, 
and then you use a, um, a deterministic hash function to take the substructure and convert it into an integer. And that integer tells you what bit you are setting. And then if desired, you can take that, uh, that bit and fold it down to get a number uh, between, commonly between one and 2048 or uh, some other multiple of, of eight. Um, this, so it results in a smaller fingerprint, faster similarity comparison, but it can also result in bit collision where two different substructures end up setting the same bit. So it has its uh, uh, drawbacks. So this is a, a common type of um, uh, this uh, hash-based fingerprint. So the substructure here is an atom pair. So look, so here we have two oxygen atoms with a, with a single, with a vertex degree of one, and they're separated by four bonds. And so that in it of itself is a substructure. Here we have two oxygen atoms, each with a, um, with a heavy atom vertex degree of one and separated by seven atoms, seven bonds. And so that is another type of substructure. And so when you apply this type of uh, algorithm onto a molecule, and generate all of the different atom pairs within that molecule, it's the common practice is to then take those atom pairs, those substructures, and hash those to a 64-bit integer. And uh, then those are used as the keys in the count vector. It's also possible to, uh, to, um, to, get it, to use this in a bit vector form where you, um, you ignore the count information. So, right, so um, another type of common substructure is to use path-based fingerprints. This, this is a type of substructure that was uh, popularized by the Daylight Company. And so here, you generate what you do is when you look at a molecule, generate all paths of, uh, with a given length. And oftentimes that is a, is a range. So for the, um, for the RD kit uh, fingerprint function, it will generate all paths between uh, with a length between length of one or seven, and then from those, take those paths, look at all the atoms in the paths and uh, atom properties and bond properties, and combine all that together to generate a, uh, um, a hash that is then folded down to a bit between one and two thousand and forty-eight, and you set that bit. And when you do that, uh, it might set um, the, these min bits. Alternatively, if you uh, set the, uh, the min path length instead of one to, to four, you set fewer bits. Um, circular fingerprints are a similar kind of thing where you, uh, gen rather than all paths, you look at all, uh, all substructures where atoms are a given length, a given uh, a topological distance from a, a, a particular atom. But the, it's the same type of uh, uh, um, action where you generate algorithmically, generate all the possible substructures, convert, take those substructures, convert it to a hash, and then uh, set that bit. Uh, so we can wrap this all up into a molecule nearest function. Um, and I won't bother to evaluate this. It's, it's fairly speedy, but I don't, we are running short on time. Essentially, you can, um, in this example here, we take a list of uh, um, 2,000 molecules taken from, curated from PubChem by Bob Nackbar, and we uh, convert those to molecules, and then we take a query molecule, and we try to find the, uh, the, the most similar molecule to it. And so this example just shows that based on the different types of fingerprints, you can get very different answers to what is the nearest molecule um, to, uh, to the query. So now I think it is time that I should skip on ahead to um, uh, molecule draw because it is the new feature and uh, it's fairly neat, I think. 
Um, so the idea here is that you can interactively create and edit molecules. Um, and so you can add, modify bonds. Uh, it's, 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 we need more features. So hopefully more features will be to come. But essentially, uh, so we start here with an empty palette. I select a single bond. I got it in there. I start adding more bonds. Now I can just come in and uh, close the loop. If I don't like the way that it ended up looking, I redraw it. I can change one of those atoms to an oxygen. And then I can uh, put a chlorine on that oxygen and it should complain to me. It did, it highlights it in red because oxygen doesn't like having three bonds, unless of course it has a uh, uh, positive charge. So we add the charge and everything seems fine. And now we return that and we have a molecule. We could also do this on existing molecules. So first we, uh, we use the uh, optical recognition. We recognize this as a molecule and then we draw it. Um, Right, and so we can go in here and start uh, um, adding uh, adding atoms, and then uh, so that that didn't that didn't quite work. So I'm going to need to figure out what happened there, so I can undo the things that I've done, or I can redo them. And that is essentially the way the, uh, uh, the editor works here. I can delete, I can delete bonds. Yeah. And so I think at uh, 9.58 is a good time to uh, stop the talk and uh, move to the, um, let's see, future directions. I want to, I want to, to mention this. Um, we are looking uh, at what to do next, right? Uh, new data structures, what uh, enhancements to 2D and 3D plots. We want to add labels to, to plots, uh, add uh, custom R group labeling, custom styling. Uh, we're interested in looking at uh, chemical reactions or macromolecules, having tighter connections to external sources. These are all things that, uh, that, <clears throat> that, are, um, that we are looking at. And if uh, we welcome any feedback to help us uh, prioritize that. Um, so now I tab over to see if anybody has uh, asked any questions. But other than that, I think that um, that is the, uh, the talk. Ah, so, um, Let's see. So when we when you create a three D structure, right? So so all you're starting just from the from the um, the graph, the chemical graph. You know you know what the connectivity is of the the protein. Generating the three D structure for that is a high, is a very non trivial task. Um, we use uh, a distance matrix, a distance geometry method, <clears throat> which attempts to to use some uh, some real world information to generate a random uh, structure which is then, um, what do you, uh, then minimized uh, using the MMFF uh, force field. Um, and uh, yes, I will upload the notebook here as soon as the, the talk is over. I think, uh, and with that, I think the, the time is over. Thank you very much.